Good morning everybody and welcome back to the Celtic Way Morning Briefing for Thursday the 2nd of November. My name is Ryan McGinley. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Graeme McGarry. Graeme, how are you doing this morning? I'm good, thanks Ryan. Thanks for having me on. No bother at all. It feels like it feels like I've hardly been off because Tony and I were doing the, the post-match last night. A couple of hours sleep and then back on to it in the morning briefing. Wouldn't have it any other way, um, but you're just always talking about Celtic. But it's not, no complaints with that. Absolutely no complaints from me, especially when Celtic get the win last night. Um, thank you. To, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, absolutely. I, I thought they were going to stop last night at some point, but um, no, they managed to get it in the end. Before we get started and talk about today's topics, um, can I just say thank you once again to our sponsors, which are MPH Group. The Morning Briefing is brought to you by MPH Group, as are all of our videos. MPH Group is Scotland's award-winning family-run all-trade specialists covering all of mainland Scotland. Every service you opt for automatically enters you into MPH's incredible holiday giveaway. You could win a seven-night stay at the luxurious five-star Moon Palace Resort in Cancun, Mexico. They currently also have a winter deal available regarding boiler installation for just 1795, which includes a free high thermostat, free first year service, up to 12 years of warranty, a magnetic filter included, and flexible finance options from as little as £5 a week. So for all of your um your plumbing, heating, kitchens and bathroom works, look no further than MPH Group. All the links are in the description. And if you just have a wee look at the bottom of the screen, I will put the banner up for the Celtic Way website, which I forgot to do. Uh, please subscribe to the Celtic Way website, £4 for four months, £18 for a year, uh, and support top quality football journalism covering the club you love. Visit www.celticway.co.uk forward slash subscribe. There's Q&As on there, instant analysis. There'll be a stats bomb piece coming out from me this afternoon. I'll try and get that out as soon as possible. So everything you're looking for in post-match content with regard to the St Martin game, it's all on the Celtic Way website. Please have a look and please subscribe if you haven't done so already so yeah going back to the game that happened last night you know Celtic were just coming off enough in each draw with Hibs they couldn't be dropping any more points especially if the results at the other end of the city they've been getting wins as well you know winning quite comfortably last night very comfortably in Dundee last night so it was up to Celtic to to make sure that that skid didn't keep on happening in terms of the in terms of the drawing of games. I know the Atletico Madrid game was a draw, but that, that felt like more of a win given the circumstances and given the team that they were playing against. Um, just going into the game last night, Graham, did you feel that there was a a sense of optimism about the game, or do you find did you did you find it as nervy as I as I found it, especially in the ground? That I felt like it was a very a very nervy atmosphere going into Celtic Park, and and it, it definitely played on to proceedings. I felt. Yeah, I thought it was a, a dangerous fixture, I've got to say, Ryan, because St Mirren have been doing like, exceptionally well this season uh, under Stephen like Robinson. They were here last night uh, levelling points with Rangers, don't forget, you know. So um, they've been going great guns and uh, they're a very difficult team, especially if you lose a late, an early goal against them, sorry. Um, they're so well organised, they're set up brilliantly. Um, and I think a combination of things, obviously, Brendan decided to rest quite a few guys last night with the, the kind of packed schedule that Celtic have got that seven games in 21 days that he's been talking about that they're kind of midway through now. Um, so I thought there was a kind of, you know, a perfect storm there that sort of looked as if it might result in a wee slip from Celtic, but all credit to them. You know, the, we've, we've talked a lot about the sort of impact off the bench in the last kind of week or so, especially Easter Road, where it wasn't great. Um, I think the guys who came on last night did have an impact. I thought Yang looked good. I know we'll go on to talk about uh, Odin Thiago Holm, who was, it was very good when he came on. So, yeah, I think... That could be a really big result in, in the context of the season. As you mentioned, Rangers have started to pick up a wee bit. They've got the new manager bounce, if you like. And it's important, I think, from a Celtic point of view, just to kind of keep that at bay. Don't let it bubble over too much because I think if Celtic drop points two games in a row and Rangers win 5 0, the narrative starts to shift a wee bit that, oh, here they come again. And um, I know you, I mean, We've heard that all before from, from Ibrox in the last few years, you know, but um, I just think it, that was important. That was a kind of statement last night from Celtic to say, no, we're still here and we're still going to grind out results. Uh, and I think it's it could be a massive goal in the context of the season. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think they went behind. Ve they went behind very, very early on to St. Martin. It was a great, a great ball in from uh, Kielty. Was it McMenamin that scored the header? Yeah, for, uh, it was a it was a phenomenal goal to be honest from St. Martin's point of view, and the. You know, they, they they faced some early pressure, but they, they got a counter-attack on and they, and they managed to get the ball. Greg Kielty's been a, a player 
in and around the SPFL for years. You know, he's a, a great delivery into the box and a great header. Joe Hart could do absolutely nothing about that. But Celtic, Celtic did respond quickly. They were only behind for what felt like a few minutes when David Turnbull got the ball in and, 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 and strike and struck it back into the, into the back of the net with an absolute thunderbolt of a strike. We know that he's got that in his locker, but he did face a bit of criticism before the goal with some of his passing. He wasn't the only one to be uh, giving away stray passes. Because Cal McGregor, I think, accounted three out of his first four passes were, it, were wayward or they were trying to get to their intended target, but they were maybe a wee bit too short and all players were having to run a couple of yards to get to the passes. It, it just wasn't at its fluent fluent best at, at the beginning but it, sometimes you have to force the issue and David Turnbull certainly did that with a with a phenomenal strike from the edge of the box didn't he? Yeah and I think you know the, the early kind of signs in the game I think there's a sort of combination of factors with that as well I think Celtic were a wee bit leggy they, they took a wee bit of time to get going um, when Callum McGregor's misplacing passes and simple passes you'd expect him to make you know 99 times out of 100 you know that they're just a wee bit off it and to give credit to St Mirren, they were really closing those passing lanes down very well as, as well, you know, so you've got to look at both sides. From Turnbull's point of view, yeah, he started the game, like a lot of his teammates, quite sloppily, I thought. Um, and, you know, I think the goal, we talk about big moments and O's goal being a big moment. I think this could be a big moment for David. Um, absolutely. I mean, I think probably the celebrations what's got him into a, a bit of heat, I guess, with the Celtic support afterwards. But I think it's been a difficult time for him. Um, I think just playing devil's advocate, I think a lot of this, this sort of criticism that's that's come his way, some of it fair, some of it maybe over the top, I think, um, has got to him. I don't think he's he doesn't live in a bubble. I think he hears all this kind of stuff. Um, he's still a relatively young man. You, you don't forget, he's 24. Um, so it must, be, it must be difficult, you know, coming and making that step up for a club like Mother Oakley Celtic, doing well, then having to deal with the sort of peaks and troughs that come along with it. Um, and I just hope for his sake, and I think for Celtic's sake as well, given that Hitati's out just now, I think he can kick on a wee bit from here because he does offer a, a real good threat. Um, it might not be a, a nailed on starter for Celtic, perhaps ever, but he's a really good option um, and somebody who has got that in their locker when the team's struggling a wee bit and they're just not quite breaking teams down and the team's happy to sit in. He's got that where he can hit it from distance. Um, it was a brilliant strike, and we know he's got that. Um, as you say, he's got that great technical ability. Um, and I just hope for his sake that not only is it the start of maybe a, a better run for him in the team, but also maybe a, a wee turn into the page with his, his relationship with the Celtic support. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of caught in two minds with the celebration because on, on one, one end, you're like, you know, you, you've got every right to give a bit back if you if you're getting criticism early on in the game. You've shown how good you can be. But the other, the other way, I'm, I'm thinking you don't need to, you don't need to put a target on your back when you're already facing criticism. I seem to remember Lee Griffiths doing the same about three, four years ago with the, with the Celtic supporters. You know, it, it can have either a positive or a mental effect. We'll see how it goes in the coming games. Just, I just want to talk about Turnbull for a bit because it's, it's well documented that he's only got about six, seven months left in his contract. His contract is up next summer. Now, at the start of the season, he had that really good performance against Ross County, where he scored two goals, including a penalty which is we'll, we'll get on to talking about penalties <laughs> in a couple of minutes uh, it seems to be Celtic's Achilles heel at the moment but you know he had that good performance against Ross County he had the chance to follow that up Brendan Rodgers persevered with him against not persevered but gave him another chance against uh, against Aberdeen he didn't take it was taken off at half time brought on by Rio Hatati. I know Hatati got injured in that game but for that 20 minutes Hatati showed what he could do up at Pataudry He's a player that does go up and down in terms of form. He's very, I don't, I don't know if temperamental is the right word, but maybe it is with regard to his form. He can be so good and then he can be so ineffective in games. Maybe that's why the Celtic fans and the Celtic support get get annoyed with his performances because they all know that he's uh, that the ability is there. It's, it's obvious he's a technically a very, very good footballer, but he just goes up and down. And with six, seven months on his, on his deal, you know, you, you see other players that have just joined the club, like Oden Home, who got his chance, who we, we will go on to talk about, who's got five years left in his deal, Paolo Bernardo, who's got an option to buy on his deal. These are very much guys that are coming into the team rather than guys that have maybe got a, a thought of going out of the team. Do you think that's maybe come into, do you think that maybe that relationship between Turnbull and the fans could be mended if there was a, a signing of a new deal? I'm not sure that would do it. I think he's still got a bit to do to earn a new deal, to be honest. I mean, yeah. I'm a big fan of David Turnbull, but I, I do think that he has to find consistency in his game. You know, that's that's the bottom line. He will be taking criticism. And as I said before, I, th I think some of it's been really fair and I think some of it's been over the top. But also, I do think that 
when you're at Celtic, you've got to be able to handle that. You know, you've got to be able to show that no matter what, the, the sort of outside noise, if, if you like, you've got to go on that pitch and consistently perform. You're not going to play for a top team like Celtic. And I think maybe that's where David is at the moment. He has to prove that these aren't just flashes in the pan. You know, he has to come in and, and consistently do performances like or reach that level of performance like he did against Ross County, like he did against St Mirren. Because when you look back through his Celtic career, he's got all these kind of brilliant highlights, the hat trick against St Mirren one time at Celtic Park, I remember. But it seems to be these sort of games in which he's shining. You know, I think what he's missing from his Celtic CV is a really big performance in maybe a Rangers game or a game against a European team. Which, I mean, obviously playing devil's advocate, he doesn't always play in those games, but in fairness to him, but when he does, I don't think he's had the impact that he probably would like to have. And sometimes he does have against lesser lights, if you like. So it's kind of funny one for David. I think he is in a kind of crossroads at his Celtic career at the moment. And the next few months could be could be massive for him. And I think with Hitati being out, that does just open a wee door for him to get in there and show. I mean, he's going to have massive competition from the likes of home, Bernardo, Awata, who, who scored a great goal at Tynecastle, obviously. So it's not a given that he's going to get that chance, but he was handed a chance last night. And I think on the whole, he took it. I think his goal was good. His penalty a wee bit rushed, um, I would say. Um, but overall, I think after the goal, his, his performance improved. And I think what would be encouraging is when he was subbed off later on in the game, he got a warm reception for the fans. And I think mm. that will go a lot for his confidence. Yeah, absolutely. Um, delighted that he got the goal. It was a, you know, we'll, we'll go on to talk about Celtic's Achilles heel at the moment, which seems to be penalties. You know, if you if you're getting penalties and you're only scoring sixty percent of them, I think it is. They've only scored I think that was the start that Tony had last night. I think they, yeah. they, they've missed two this season, two out of a uh, two out of the is it five or six that they've got? It was it was sixty percent anyway of the penalties that they've received they've scored. So, you know, that forty percent uh, Penalties are high XG shots. When when I do the stats bomb reports, they're always at 0 0.7, 0 0.8. They're, they're basically gimmies for strikers or, or forward players who are good at striking the ball. Now, all of a sudden, it doesn't. I don't think Celtic know who their penalty kick taker will be because Turnbull was the designated penalty kick taker on the night, but we don't know if he's going to be playing every single game. So if he's not in the team, who's going to be the next player to take a penalty? Because Hatati's injured for the next two months, next month and a half, two months. Um, I was just thinking last night, I was talking to the guys around me of who would get the next penalty if Celtic were to get one. Um, you, you know, you, you look at Matt O'Reilly, maybe Lewis Palmer with the, the set pieces, but even Lewis Palmer hasn't taken all of the set pieces. I, I thought he would come in and really sort of dominate that with his, with his delivery. All the all the highlights packages in Greece for Aris were showing him taking set pieces, corners, free kicks, um, penalties as well, I'm sure. Who, who, do, who do you think will be that next player to, st to step up for, for penalties when Celtic get one? Because it seems as if it's a bit of a... Now, and I was making this point to Tony last night, now there's going to be a pressure on ever sell to get their next penalty because yeah. there's that thought in everybody's head first of all who's going to take it and then are they going to score it yeah it's a sixty-four thousand dollar question as they say in it it's a it's a really strange kind of phenomenon if you like because there's Celtic with so many technically gifted players who are the guys you probably look to first of all um for penalty kicks i think going forward probably o'reilly and palmer are the two i would look at because yeah. you look at the guys who have got that clean connection who have got the technical ability and those two would sort of logically be the next candidates. I think Turnbull was a good penalty taker. I think I've seen him score plenty of penalties throughout his career. Uh, Brendan Rogers said after the game last night, he just thought he snatched at it a wee bit. He was just a wee bit too eager, I think, uh, just to kind of get his shot away. Um, and then obviously Hitati misses practically the identical penalty at Tynecastle um, yeah. as well. You know, before. And Kyogo did the same against St Man last Kyogo, season as well. Yeah, Kyogo again. Um, this isn't a new phenomenon, you know, it's going back a while. I mean, any last season, I think Jack and Mack has mixed a couple, didn't they? Um, so there's no obvious candidate, and I think perhaps it is just a psychological thing. Um, we sell take at the moment that there doesn't seem to be MD who is, you know, reliable from the penalty spot, because even the ones Hitati scored, some of them were kind of sneaking under the body of the goalie and all that kind of thing, you know, and um, I, I don't really see... Um, there's a reliable penalty taker in the squad at the moment. Uh, next two candidates certainly would be Matt O'Reilly. I think he's the next one I would give it a go to. And I think Palmer obviously has got great ability in his right foot as well. So I think those two are, are probably next in line. But it's going to be tricky for whoever goes up and take them. There may be a case just for getting big Carter Vickers to go up and well it, you know. <laughs> Who knows? 
Yeah, we, we Tony and I were making the point last night of you know Barry Robson's the manager at Aberdeen. Just bring him back as a as a designated penalty kick taker because he used to right. absolutely <laughs> thump them I into the back of the net. I remember the one against Rangers in particular back 10, 15 years ago now. Um but yeah, I, I think you know it could even go back to Cal McGregor. I know he took a couple um a few seasons ago. So it's something that needs resolved. I think I think there'll definitely be a bit of focus today in training with regard to penalties in case Celtic mm-hmm. get one in the next game because I think that's got to be rectified. There's got to be somebody. Uh, Tony was talking about a, a penalty kick competition that needs to happen at training today. Um, <laughs> it's definitely something that needs to be needs to be rectified and focused on going forward because if you're given these opportunities then you, you've really got to take them when they're when they're presented to you and it just becomes a bit more of a problem and more pressure as well when when you step up to take one and there's that worry about and there's always going to be the worry about not taking a penalty especially with Celtic because Celtic historically have not been good with penalties you know the time that I've watched them there's been just as many missed it it feels like rather than rather than scored but um yeah, there's always going to be that pressure, and you're just hoping that that's that's rectified in the coming, the coming days for for Dingwall if they do get a penalty up north. Um, I think the thing is, Ryan, you know, it's not cost them yet. You know, um, in mm. terms of points, um, obviously, Tyne Castle they were kind of home and hosed anyway, and then uh, last night though it could have been a lot, you know, a lot more kind of an easier night anyway if, if David tucks that one away because um, it's still in the first half you go 2-1 up you've come back from a goal down second half would be an entirely different affair as it was he misses the penalty and the second half really anxious and, and Brendan has to make lots of changes to try and push um, and, and really you know uh, it was a really nervy kind of last 20 minutes I think because yeah but the seventieth minute till the goal, I don't think it looked as if Celtic were going to score. You know, they weren't creating real clear cut chances, and the crowd were starting to get a wee bit antsy. You could sense it. Um, so yeah, I mean, at the moment they're getting away with it, but it's, it's definitely something that that could prove costly further down the line if they don't rectify it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Brendan Rogers is actually disagreeing with you with what you with what you said because he thought that the goal <laughs> was coming in the last twenty minutes. Um, uh, just gonna nice. read out, just gonna read out some of his his comments. Um, Celtic boss said it was coming. Listen, it's one of those ones. You know the game last ninety plus minutes, so you trust your team. They've scored late goals already this season. It's the makeup of this club to keep going and persevere. I was really pleased with the quality of the winning goal. We saw that at Motherwell when we got the winner with Matt O'Reilly late on with eighty odd minutes on the clock. There, you can start to panic, but we worked the ball really well. So it, although it didn't look as if Celtic were, were probing for that, I know they were probing for the, and trying to get the late winner. It didn't look obvious that it was coming. But it sh- just shows you that they were calm in that instance, especially at home when the fans were maybe maybe getting a, a little bit more touchy with regard to getting a late goal. They, mm. they took their time, they allowed the ball, they worked the ball into an area and they got they got their just rewards with a really, really um, well-worked goal, in, in truth. Yeah, just to pick up on Brendan's comments here, it's, it shows you the importance of context. When you see it written down, <laughs> he actually was laughing when he said that. You know, he was saying, oh, no, it was, ah, right. it was always coming. It was always coming. <laughs> kind of twinkle his eye with that one. But um, listen, he's got he's got a right to have faith in his team to get late goals. But I think the difference between last night and, and the Motherwell game that he mentions was, even when Motherwell equalised that 95th minute, I think you were sitting beside me, Ryan, and mm-hmm. I, I turned out to you and said, I think Celtic will score here. <laughs> and they said, a feeling, you know, the way they were playing, they looked a lot more dangerous, I think, than they did last night. And their football was a lot you know, smoother, a lot slicker. I just thought they've got at least another chance in them here. Um, now, the goal itself last night when it came was a brilliant goal. You know, it really was. I mean, the, the, the play between Kyogo and home, the calmness of home to play in O as well, because he could have got a shot away there. You know, he definitely could. I think Brendan mentioned that as well. Um, and then O's composure to take a touch and finish it, especially when he missed a couple at Tynecastle, if you remember. Mm-hmm. Um, so that might have been playing on his mind. He really kind of took it really well. Um, so as much as that was a great bit of football, I, did, I just didn't see enough of that, I guess, um, in the sort of preceding minutes that kind of suggested that that was coming. Um, but fair play, you know, they did they did dig it out and uh, the, the subs, as we said, had a great impact and it was a really good goal in the end. Yeah, Pablo67 comes in. Thank you for co- your comment. Disjointed last night, but we dug deep and got the three points. I actually thought they played better than they did against Hibs at the weekend. You know, I thought some of their passing play was a little bit better than against Hibs. I know they had a lot of chances in the final 20 minutes at Hibs and at Celtic Park, but I just think some of the passing was... Yeah, 
the, the passing was more there than maybe against Hibs. Hibs were well well drilled, you know, they, they were probably deserving of their point in the end, but I, I thought Celtic's passing was a bit better. And they got they got the breakthrough in the end, you know, the the, the title of this video is is, is old and Thiago home, the heir to Rio Hatati's midfield throne for Celtic. Yes, I, I'll caveat that by saying it's a stand-in throne just now, you know, Hatati yeah. will be back after a couple of months and probably walk back into the starting lineup. I think there was a Hatati filled hole last night until Oden home came onto the park. Any team is going to miss Rio Hitati when he's not playing. It's his guile, it's his agility, it's his ability to break lines. It's those risky passes that he plays. Yes, his stats won't look as good in terms of his passing accuracy, but he takes risks and he makes things happen for Celtic. Um, when maybe other players try and play it safe, he'll go for the risky pass always. Um, he'll take the stick from the manager, but he'll keep on doing it. He's, he's definitely still playing Ange ball because you know, he was told to play those risky passes. He's going to continue to play that. It's the only way he knows. Um, but Oden Home came on last night and I thought instantly he was trying to make things happen, trying to make a difference, a positive difference in the game. And I think he's the most important part. I know I know that O scores the goal and it's a phenomenal finish, but it's just the shift in direction from Oden Home that catches St Martin out. They were, they were defending absolutely everything that Celtic had to, to throw at them. And then Oden Home just does something out of the out of the blue, out of the box, straight out of the box. Um, he could have went one way with one foot. Instead, he goes the other and sort of slices the ball to O. And mm. you know, it's it's a great pass. O takes one touch and then and slams it into the roof of the net. I just think this was this was home big moment last night, and I'm glad that his assist hasn't been lost in the in, in the euphoria of the O goal because I think it is the most important part. That that goal doesn't happen without. Uh, Holmes' intervention into uh, that pass into O's feet. I just think it was a great bit of play from the Norwegian. And only 20 years old, you know, he's going to be in and out of the team, we know that, but I think he showed all of his quality last night. Yeah, I was impressed by him, I've got to say. And, uh, you know, I've been impressed by him um, at various points. Of his, I know he's only had one start for Celtic so far in, in the League Cup and uh, I think five sub-appearances now, maybe six. But I think last night was the biggest impact that he's had since he came on. Um, and I think... What happened in Feyenoord has probably just fired him up a wee bit as well because I think that was a chasing experience for him and a, and a big yeah. learning experience for him as well. And I think his manager did give him a bit of a dressing down after that for his naivety. Um, so I think that was a big evening for him, even though it was something that you know was a, a bit of adversity early on in his Celtic career. I think last night he showed he's got the character to sort of come back from that um, and try and seize his chance when it comes. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to seeing a bit more of him I've got to say I think as much as I like David Turnbull in that role because of the technical ability he's got I think Odin's closer to that sort of mixture of technical ability and real energy that Hitati mm. brings to the team because I think it's so evident when Hitati is not in that midfield that the sort of the, the energy, the enthusiasm that he brings is, is so missed um, and I think when home came on last night, it just looked a wee bit more like it, you know, from a Celtic point of view. Ball was getting moved a wee bit quicker. He was harassing opponents. He was in their face. Um, he's definitely not lacking self-belief. <laughs> no, home. absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, for a kid of 20 to come over here um, and you really kind of show what he's all about. I think we all saw his, his Instagram post after the Aberdeen game. Um, so uh, he's not he's not lacking in uh, confidence, I'll say that for him. Um, but he's certainly not lacking in ability to back that up as well. Um, so, Important not to get carried away, I think. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a small snippet uh, in a 10-minute appearance um, that he's done really well. All credit to him for it. But I think as well, he's shown he's definitely in that conversation to replace Hitati and he could definitely come in and, and just offer something a wee bit different um, from the likes of Turnbull, the likes of Bernardo. But I thought something a wee bit more similar, I guess, to Hitati. Yeah, I think I think that's the point that Tony and I were making as as well. He'll bring you that bit of guile, that bit of agility in the midfield that you miss when Hatati's not there. Any team, as I said before, is going to miss Hatati when he's not playing. But there was a point in the game last night where Odenholm was dribbling with the ball. The ball was hardly going. It was only maybe going one or two feet ahead of him. It was just sticking to him. His dribbling ability is clearly there. Um, you know, he's he, he changed his name to Odin Tiago home. It was it was a pass last night that. Uh, his, his idol would have been proud of and Thiago Alcantara I don't know if he would have been as far up the pitch Thiago likes to play in that, that deeper role but Odenholm found his, found his uh, opportunity to play that ball into O O did the rest um, we should probably go on to talk about O but before that um, you know Kyogo was, was important in that goal as well but he is cutting a bit of a frustrated figure at the moment in the team yes he has been scoring a couple of goals he scored that uh, 
he, he, he scored in uh, Town Castle and he scored against Atletico Madrid, but he has been cutting a bit of a, a frustrating figure, not getting a lot of touches of the ball. I think he got five touches in the game against Hibs at the weekend. Um, mm. You know, he's, he's very isolated up there. Then he had a, a few more touches last night, but again, you know, he's having to come deep in order to affect the game. He had that chance right at the end where he's trying to chip the goalkeeper. He's yeah. uh, he's listening to the best since Larson and trying to do one better. And then <laughs> Larson, great save by Zach Heyman, who I thought was very, very impressive in the game. Couple of really, really good saves. Um, but yeah, he's, he's cutting a bit of a frustrated figure up front at the moment. Um, not, a, not a lot of delivery is coming his way. And then when he's having to take a chance, it's maybe only one or two chances that are coming his way and he's having to put them away. Yeah, I don't worry about Kyogo, I've got to say. like, um, I think there was a lot of chat about him earlier in the season and the type of role that he was playing and how Brendan was asked to come a bit deeper than what Andrew previously had and, and ask him to kind of take part in the build-up play and all that kind of thing. I don't think he's really doing that. As you said, in the, in the last few weeks, he's not been taking part at all, really. He's been trying to come back, but he's, he's kind of pushing up front. And as a result, he's, as you say, he's, he's not really getting a lot of involvement in the match. Um, but on the flip side of that, he's also not getting a great many chances as well. Um, so last night, though, I thought he had a couple of chances that he kind of snatched that a wee bit. He um, made the header in the second half where, in fairness to him, he's just tried to guide it into the far post and he's... He's made a bit of a mess of it. And then he just didn't get the proper connection. The one at the end he's got to score for me. I don't know Hemings made a good save, but sometimes with Kyogo, I do think that when he's got a chance, where he's got plenty of time to think about it. Um, it's that old cliche about a striker who's better on instinct. And I think he definitely is. Um, and he just tried to be a wee bit too cute at the end. And I think if that was one each at that point, he probably wouldn't have tried what he did. He probably would have went through and just smashed it into the corner. But he's obviously tried to do the, the henky as you, as, you, as you said there Absolutely. but um, well, listen, I, I'm not worried about him at all I think he'll always score goals I mean his movement is incredible his finishing when he's in the zone is very good um, he's a real good instinct striker he comes up with big goals as well recently he's shown that he can score at Champions League level this season which I think is huge um, after all the kind of question marks that were around him previously with that because I think Probably last season he was missing chances like the ones he had last night at Champions League level. This year he's shown that he can finish at the top level. I think his finish against Atletico Madrid was absolutely sensational. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think he'll go be fine. Um, just a case of maybe he's still sort of finding his role within the Brendan Rodgers team, if you like, and, and exactly what uh, the manager's asking him to do. But he'll score. I mean, I comfortably predict he'll score 20 goals at least this season. No problem at all. Yeah, hopefully. And hopefully the man that scored the winner can get somewhere near that amount or, you know, get into double figures with his goals. Yeah. I know that, that was his first goal of the season. It's been a bit of a barren run for uh, Hyung Yu Oh, but massive, massive moment for him. Brendan Rodgers was singing his praises last night, saying that he takes care of himself. He's the model professional. I was a bit worried when he was making those comments because I've heard this before about players that he's called good professionals and takes care of mm. themselves. Because he said the same about Effie Ambrose. He also said the same about Yuki Kobayashi. Um, yeah. I think last week where sometimes you can read a bit into what he doesn't say about a player more than he does. Um, you know, it, it, but he made a massive impact coming off the bench as we talked about that pass from home to him. He takes a touch and then it skyrockets into the into the roof of the net. You know, I, from where I was sitting, I thought he'd skied it. I, um, he, he placed it absolutely perfectly. Um, looking back on the replay, everybody on the telly was like, no, it was a perfect finish. But from where I was sitting, it looked as if he'd skied it. I was like, has he scored? No, and then you see the net ripple and, and, and you're, you're calm and then the euphoria can begin. But yeah, it was like, it was a great a, a great shot and a great goal from him. You know, he, he took his time, took the uh, took the pass from home, took a touch and then... And, and, and scored so what a massive moment in the season for him especially with the struggles that he had both at Tyne Castle and the Easter Road I look back in that chance that he had on Saturday it was a bit of a half chance but instead of going for it with his feet he goes for it with his head when he's so far out and it's just the wrong yeah. decision at that moment he makes the right decision and he gets his reward for it yeah I, I like him um, I, th I think he's got something about him and he offers something definitely different from what Kyogo does and I think even in the conversation with Kyogo I think you need to kind of factor in that O oh, maybe hasn't been trusted all that much by Brendan Rodgers. So with Kyogo, he's kind of been horsewhipped a wee bit. You know, he's been playing just about all the time and, and there might be a wee bit of fatigue there as well, both mental and physical. But just on O oh, specifically, I think, you know, Brendan's comments, you're, you're, you're right there, Ryan, in what you say. He has mentioned these kind of 
factors about players conditioning themselves really well and being patient and all the rest of it. I think in O's sort of case, that's about keeping his feet in the ground um, because he's not going to start games ahead of Kyogo. Brendan was very explicit about that last night. You know, he's saying it's difficult for a guy who's the second striker, who's playing behind a good striker, behind a top striker, has to be patient. You know, I think he's just looking at a young player there and he's just saying, great moment for him, absolutely, but let's keep your feet in the ground, pal, um, and sort of realise you've still got a whole lot of work to do before you're going to be near Kyogo's level for a start. And secondly, to be regularly troubling the Celtic starting 11. I wouldn't be surprised to see him get a run this weekend. I think he mm-hmm. might start on Saturday because you've got the Atletico game coming up on Tuesday night. It's a very quick turnaround. Travelling to Dingwall, I think he might rescue Kyogo um, on Saturday and give him a chance. And I'm really intrigued to see how he gets on um, if he does get a start and whether he can actually you know, plant his flag as saying, you know, ah, I'm a good, reliable backup option for Kyogo because I think even that has been in question recently. Never mind the question about O starting games. It's whether O is even a reliable option off the bench. And hopefully last night is the kind of start of, of him showing that, yeah, I can be a really good backup option for Celtic. And if things aren't going to plan, you can throw me on and I'll come up with something. Yeah, and I, I don't even think that was a conversation last season because he was when he was coming off the bench, he was making making an impact. You know, maybe he wasn't scoring in every game. I think he got, what, seven goals in the second half of the season? Because mm. people were saying that was his eighth goal or ninth goal for Celtic. It was seven or eight. So he was making an impact. You know, that last game of the season or the last uh, home game of the season against Aberdeen, it, I think he, he was the he was the sort of part and thought going into the, the, the pre-season of what he could be the season after. He's one of those players that I was talking about last week that could maybe get caught in the middle of managers. You know, he was brought in by Ange Postacoglu. Ange Postacoglu clearly rated him, um, parted, parted with money in, in, in January to bring him in, was patient in bringing him in. I remember his, his press conference and his, his interview after, after O signed. He was absolutely delighted to get him through the door. Yeah. You don't know if every manager is different. A manager will see different things in a player, and I, I was I was wondering if O was the right fit. Then there was that injury problem, the thing that he didn't disclose an injury after the Athletic Club game. Then went on to try and play against Ross County, was on the bench but didn't come on. Then aggravated his injury, you know, and it's that trust between a, a striker and a, a manager, but. There were good comments from Brendan Rodgers last night. I don't want to read into them too much because we have heard them before with certain players in terms of professionalism, their diet, that how they keep themselves fit. But it's a really good start for O. He was the hero last night. He deserves all the credit that's going to be coming his way. And in a very difficult and physical game that it will be at Dingwall, maybe O might be the better option to really um, cement himself as as an option for Celtic, not just a backup, but a, a player that can come in in these in these difficult away games and make an impact. Yeah, definitely. And I think, listen, you've got to caveat everything that, that Brendan Rodgers is saying about these backup players as well, with the fact that he wants to bring in some quality starters in January. So I don't think you'll hear Brendan, you know, talking up these boys too much, you know, because no. he doesn't want the board thinking, oh, well, you know, there's the, the bench is well stacked. I think Brendan will give due credit where it is due, but He'll also want to draw into focus that there is a wee bit of a drop off in terms of the, the starting eleven to the guys in the bench, and he'll certainly want to keep that in the forefront of the the minds of the board anyway going into January. But just don't know. I think uh, he's got he's definitely got attributes. I think he's he's, he's physical. Um, he poses a different question to Kyogo, but also he showed last night he does have that composure um, in front of goal when it when it matters, you know, and, and he can have that. I think this season he's been very anxious when he's been on the pitch. I think he's been snatching at things. And um I th- you look at Awata's goal at Tynecastle. And Brendan mentioned this after the game. Oh his two shots at getting it in the net. Um easier chances than what Awata had. Um and, and this both of them hit the keeper, hit the defender, and then Awata comes in and, and smashes it into the net. So could be a massive moment for him just to get that monkey off his back. It's his first goal of the season. Um and hopefully as you say, I think he'll start on Saturday and hopefully he can impress. But I would also expect that Celtic will strengthen in that area in January. So he's going to have a massive fight in his hands to even you know, stay as the, the kind of second choice striker. Yeah, I think uh, a couple of days after the transfer window shut in September, back then a few months ago, um, people were already talking about Celtic going back in for uh, Matthias Kvistgarden from Bronby. Mm-hmm. I wonder if that's maybe a deal that's 
effectively sign sign sealed and is going to be delivered in, in, in January or early doors, you know, Danish Danish striker, much in the same mould as Maeda and Kyogo. He's only five foot seven, five foot eight. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's definitely a, a player that fits that profile of Maeda and Kyogo. Um, obviously with the, the Asia Cup coming up for those two players, it's going to be interesting to see how that, that affects things going forward. But yeah. yeah, for that Ross County game, it's, it's a quick turnaround from Wednesday to Saturday, even quicker with Wednesday to Tuesday. When you look at the change in climate from Dingwall to, <laughs> to it's going to be it's going to be difficult. I know Brendan Rodgers was lamenting lamenting that at the um, mm. in one of the press conferences. He wasn't happy with the turnaround, but you know these are the cards that he's been dealt. He's going to have to he's going to have to just play with them. Um, yeah. Ross County on Saturday, they got a really good result against Hibs at Easter Road. You know, they were two nothing down, uh, but they brought it back to two each. That shows the character that they've got. They've got a striker in Jordan White that seems to always score against Celtic and Rangers. So yeah. he's a guy that'll be looking to continue that good form against one of the two Glasgow sides. Um, it'll be a difficult game. Always is a difficult game at Dingwall, but looking forward to seeing how Celtic react to that late winner. I think they'll have their, their tails up and they'll be, they'll be ready for that one. Yeah, they're a, they're a decent side, you know, I think they've picked up in recent weeks, but I mean, they scored quite a lot of goals, considering, you know, they've always been known as quite a stuffy outfit, but mm. I think they scored three at Fir Park in a 3-3 draw, and then they scored two at Easter Road, so they've definitely got, uh, you know, dangerous weapons in attack. Uh, as you say, the boy Simon Murray's come on in a game, he's got pace, but Jordan White, obviously, he's a big, big uh, threat to, to both Celtic and Rangers for some bizarre reason. Um, but I guess it's just his physical presence is, is difficult to deal with. Um, and it, it's a tricky game for Celtic, made trickier by the fact that they have to balance these fixtures. I think Brendan was right to say what he said. In Scotland, we just it's not just Scotland, don't get me wrong, but we don't help ourselves. You look at maybe, you know, in the Netherlands, they're giving teams dispensation to miss games or, or put games forward 24 hours, so they've got that extra wee rest. Uh, in Spain, Atletico have got you know, they play 24 hours earlier than Celtic than the, before the last game. So they had that extra rest day. It's massive at this level. Um, so I think it's something that's got to be looked at. I mean, we, we always talk about how the authorities are supposed to be for the good of Scottish football. Well, let's show it. Let's not send, you know, our, our champions to, to Dingwall right before a, a vital Champions League game because these fixtures are known. You don't know the teams or where they're going to be, but you know there's going to be Champions League games in that week. So mm-hmm. the logic of sending Celtic up to Dingwall on that day, I think, I'm not, I'm not suggesting there's any funny business going on. I'm just suggesting that maybe there a wee bit more thought has to go into it and try and give our teams the best possible chance to compete at that level because it's already so difficult. The cards are stacked against Celtic at Champions League level. They don't have the finance to compete with the likes in Atletico Madrid anyway. So to go there and try and give themselves a fighting chance at least give them a wee bit of a hand, I think. I mean, I don't think that's unreasonable to ask at all. Yeah, absolutely. Just before we, we finish off today, um, there was a there was a comment that I start from Maestro95, and it was, a, it was a point that I was thinking last night in the game, and I think both fullbacks did struggle in last night's game. I think Taylor was partly responsible for the goal. Uh, it was it was a great great ball in from Kielty, but he, he hasn't marked for by Taylor. Uh, he's, he's allowed to put the ball in the box, and it's a great header by McMenamin. Joe Hart can do absolutely nothing about it. Maestro just brings up, he makes a comment, I'm going to bring it up here. Is it just me or is AJ's form dipped Alistair Johnson? I've got oh. to be honest, I think it has. I think in the past couple of games, he's really struggled to get back up. I think it's because as Celtic, as people that support Celtic or people that cover Celtic, they know the levels that Alistair Johnson is used to. He's always a, a 6 or 7 out of 10, 7, 8 out of 10. I think he's maybe dipped to a few 5s and 6s in the past couple of weeks. Uh, some of his... Some of his uh, I, I thought he was quite poor against Atletico Madrid, to be honest with you. Um, obviously, had that that knock against Hibs, which can't be helped. You know, get, get whacked. <laughs> so very close proximity from Rocky Bashiri. You know, he's a very strong guy. That's going to, yeah. that's definitely <laughs> going to hop for a couple of hours. He'll, 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 we've been asking if he was playing at Tyne Castle rather than Easter Road <laughs> when, he, when he got up. Um, he wanted to continue. He didn't, but he was fine after the game. I just think his form has been a wee bit up and down recently. Um, yeah. That's just down to the fact that you expect so much from Alistair Johnson. I always call him the Cameron Carter Vickers out wide for Celtic. He's that safety net who yeah. you can always rely upon. But I think he's been up and down with his form. He just needs to get back to what he's what he does best, and that's been a solid out out ball for the team and a solid defender. He's not costing Celtic, but I just think he's not playing at the levels that that people that 
the cover Celtic know that he can. Yeah, I agree. I think he has dipped a wee bit. I think last night it was probably the most noticeable drop off in his performance level. Um, it's interesting. I mean, Greg Taylor, he he struggled at the start of the season as well, and he's he's really come on to a game, and I think he kind of did a wee dip last night as well. Whether it's you know the physical exertions that these boys have had in the last few weeks, that could be into it. I mean, obviously Alistair's missed a wee bit of football this season as well, so it's maybe difficult to then come back into the team and, and, and produce that level week in week out. Probably a Maybe there's a deeper point to be made about the fullbacks and what's been asked of them, um, because we spoke to Greg about this and he said, you know, my role hasn't changed all that much at all. I'm still being asked to come inside when it's appropriate and get on the ball, but also I've been asked to kind of get up the line as well. So I wonder if they're maybe just caught between two stools a wee bit, the, the two mm -hmm. fullbacks at the moment, between being that sort of conventional a sort of fullback who's getting up the line and, and whipping crosses in and being that sort of ange ball fullback, if you like, who plays inside the pitch and is getting on the ball in the midfield. And at the moment, probably both of them are struggling with that a wee bit, I think. Um, I think Greg, you look at the Livingston game, he played inside an awful lot in that game and, and was very impressive. In fact, I think people talked about Maeda in that game and he wasn't very, he was great, but I thought Taylor's influence in that game was, was brilliant. And he was playing that sort of conventional role. Last night, again, he was trying to go to the outside. Sometimes he was inside, sometimes he wasn't. And I, I just wonder if they're, they're sort of trying to be the best of both worlds and not quite being the master of any of them at the moment, you know. So I wonder if that's got something to do with it. And I think, again, probably the physicality um, aspect as well, where they've been you know, asked to play every week. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a backup option there, certainly in Alistair's case. Um, you've got Anthony Ralston there who... It's, it's never let Celtic down in the last couple of years when he's been in the team. You know, he, he does really well. He'd break on on Saturday. I thought he was good um, at Easter Road as well. So there may be a case on Saturday as well, as well as resting Kyogo. I know it's always tricky a balancing act between winning the game and resting some of your players, but could be a case for maybe AJ sitting that one out as well and, and just giving Tony Ralston a wee go to it. Yeah, Tony Ralston's definitely got history at Dingwall, that is for sure. Scored yeah. arguably one of Celtic's most important uh, one of the Celtic's latest goal in a long, long time. Um, yeah. Absolutely in incredible scenes back in 2021. Um, the, the last point that I'm going to talk about before we finish up today is regarding uh, a player that did get the nod last night, which is uh, James Forrest. Uh, Pablo comes in and says, fantastic servant, but his time is up at the club. You know, I think I don't think he's going to be a starter um, in most games. I think he's going to come off the bench, but last night... Um, what, what do you say about last night? He wasn't a. I don't want to say he was like a man down because I think that's too that's too harsh and too disrespectful to a player that has brought so much good to Celtic. But mm -hmm. he was very very ineffectual. And and you're you're talking you're talking about Alistair Johnson's poor performance. I don't think it helped that James Forrest was on the same side as him, not really covering him. So Alistair Johnson was kind of left his own devices to do that yeah. defending. It did look like a point of weakness down that side of the pitch. Um and yeah. That he had that chance right before he was taken off. It was the last bit of action before he made before Brendan Rodgers made that substitution. But uh, it was a great save by Zach Heyman. It was that one yeah. chance that he got, much like that chance that he got against uh, Hibs, and he didn't take yeah. it. I'm just thinking. I know Brendan Rodgers likes to talk up his man, saying that he's faster than Dyson Maeda. I'd like to see how long that sprint was because <laughs> I can't imagine anybody being faster than Dyson Maeda because yeah. Maeda will keep it up. He'll keep it going for about 90, 100, 100 metres, you would, you would assume, or even more than that. But, yeah, um, yeah with, with Forrest, it's, it, was a, it was a poor performance last night. We can't, we, can't, uh, we can't say anything else other than it was a really, really quite, not an alarming performance, but just a poor performance from James Forrest. Yeah, the thing with James is, you know, I think he's not played a great deal of football as well. You've got to say that. And I don't think... Lewis Palmer played particularly well last night either, and, and he was poor on Saturday as well. So you wouldn't kind of write off uh, Palmer after a couple of bad performances. So no. I understand that that's, that's not what we're saying about James. It's probably indicative of a, a longer-term trend of downward performances. But at the same time, I think he's definitely got something to offer. I think Saturday, yeah, he does miss that chance um, towards the end where he hits the bar. He's a wee bit unlucky, I, th I thought. But I definitely thought, of the, the attackers who came on, he was the one who made the biggest difference on Saturday. So mm -hmm. I do think he's still got a future with Celtic this season in terms of being an impact player. Being a starter, I think there's a reason why he was in there last night. I think it's obviously Brendan wants to rest certain players. 
<laughs> give Maeda a wee rest. Um, but he also thought the experience of Forrest, he'd be able to come in and, and do a job for him. And um, unfortunately, there was I think there was a, a, an incident in the first half where big Richard Taylor, the big centre half for St Mirren, comes over and brushes him off the ball, and he's looking for a foul, and I don't think it was a foul. Oh. And, um, it just kind of showed that maybe physically he's not quite there. Um, I, was, I was laughing at that comment by Brendan last week about him being the, the fastest winger at the club still. You know, like, To be fair, we did caveat that by saying he maybe can't do it over 90 minutes. You know? <laughs> so maybe one sprint, he's, he's faster than Maeda, but he's not going to do that all game. So That's me, a, He's got a, punchers, a boxer's chance, a puncher's chance. Aye, exactly. Listen, he's got that experience. He gets into good areas. You see last night, even when he's not playing well at all, um, he's still getting in a position where he probably should have scored. Um, he's got that instinct where he can get into the box and and get chances. Um, so I, th- I do think he's a useful squad member, but I can agree um, with what the, what the, the listeners saying there. I think his days as a, as a kind of starter for Celtic are probably over, and um, he's just he's a very handy option to have, not just for the impact on the pitch for maybe the last half hour, twenty minutes of a game, especially when you're maybe struggling to break somebody down but also for his sort of influence around the place because he's a fantastic guy. Bags of experience. He's brilliant with the younger players. Um, I think they can all learn a lot from him. Um, so he's definitely worth having around the place, um, both for his contribution, maybe on the pitch is waning a wee bit, but certainly off it as well. Yeah, and it's important to have these people in and around the club. You know, Scott Bain as well. I've heard there's a really, really popular player off the pitch. Doesn't get a lot of game time. Yes, he's number two at the moment. Usually, well, he was number three last season until that weird dynamic with Seacrest, um, which I don't mm. think has been explained uh, at all. It's yeah. a bit of a weird, a weird scenario. But it's important to have those players in and around the team just to keep up with the morale. I know down south, Arsenal. I have that with Mohamed El- Elneny. He doesn't yeah. play a lot of games, but he's basically brought in as a, I'm not going to call him a cheerleader, but a sort of a, a guy that people can go to. Um, and these these players are important for the squad morale off the pitch as well as on it. I, I think we've um, I think we've covered everything that we need to cover regarding the game. Um, we spoke about all the goals, go, t- spoke about some of the best performances. Yes, Yang put in a good performance as well. I didn't really talk about him as much, but he showed yeah. showed enough. I was watching the highlights last night after the game, and he's uh, some of his tricks were really really nice. He, he looks like a good young player. Definitely very definitely very raw, but there is definitely a player there at the same time. Yeah, I quite like him, I've got to say. I mean, I think when he started at Fir Park, I don't think he did very well. I think he had a kind of poor game that day um, and, and sort of dropped out the side after that. But um, I was kind of surprised when he started against Lazio, I think it was. He started the game, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Um, and he didn't really do much. Um, but yeah, last night was much more like it. I think that we that we break out the team's done him, done him some good and he looked very lively when he came on. I, I thought of all the players who came on until Holmes obviously assist. I thought he was the one who kind of looked the most likely to, to create something. So, yeah, promising signs from him. I think, you know, it's, it's you forget these guys are coming from, you know, all over the place, all over the world. They're coming to a massive club where the expectation's massive. They've never had to deal with these kind of things um, before. So it can't be easy. Um, and I, I think we've seen enough from Yang to suggest that he is acclimatising quite well. And I think he's a, a decent option off the bench as well at the moment. Yeah, and he's quite tall for a winger as well, much like Luis Palma. So he's definitely got a bit, of, a bit about him. I think if he puts on a couple of a couple of kilos in his in his weight, yeah. and, and he needs to go in that maybe that Ryan Christie diet. If he does that, then I think he'll be a, I think he'll be a hell of a player for Celtic. But yeah, I, I think he is an exciting player. I think you've always got to caveat it by the fact he was very off form at Gangwon in the yeah. in the South Korean league, and then. Made, brought it over to Celtic so it was like basically two seasons mixed into one very very difficult for a player to go on form at Celtic when he's not on form at Gangnam which is a lesser level than mm. what he'll be operating at Celtic certainly in the Champions League but it's good to see him putting a good performance I think the one mistake that he made was not cutting the ball back to Kyogo there was a chance where it, yeah. I think it hit off the, the defender when he was trying to take a shot instead of cutting it back that's the yeah. Second time that that's happened in in two games for a where an obvious pass for Kyogo has not has not been made and he's and I think Kyogo's got every right to be annoyed at not getting the ball first from Palma on Saturday because it was an obvious ball to him and then yeah. from Yang to Kyogo in last night's game. Thankfully, there was no drop points and Celtic were the winners on the day. But I think I think that's everything that we've, we've spoke about today. We went on for 49, 50 minutes. Thank you very much, Graham, for for joining me this morning. I really do appreciate it. Um, I know it's been a it's been a, a quick turnaround because you were at the game last night and then uh, back on this morning. But I really do appreciate it. 
no problem. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. No bother at all. Um, before we finish off, guys, um, once again, if I could get everybody to look at the top of the screen once again, okay. uh, the morning briefings and our videos are sponsored by MPH Group, which is Scotland's award-winning family-run all-trade specialist covering all of mainland Scotland. Every service you opt for automatically enters you into MPH's incredible holiday giveaway. You could win a seven-night stay at the luxurious five-star Moon Palace Resort in Cancun, Mexico. They also currently have a winter deal available regarding boiler installation for just 1795 which includes a free high thermostat, free first year service, up to 12 years of warranty, a magnetic filter included, and flexible finance options from as little as £5 a week. So if you're looking for any work in plumbing, heating, kitchens or bathrooms, then look no further than MPH Group. All of the links are in the description, their social media, their contact number and their website as well. Before we finish off once again, guys, we can't continue to do what we do without your support on the website. Um, please subscribe to the YouTube channel, of course, but um, please subscribe to the website as well. Um, £4 for four months or £18 for a full year. You'll be supporting top quality football journalism covering the club you love at www.celticway.co.uk forward slash subscribe. On there today, this afternoon, there'll be a stats bomb report that I'll be working on as soon as I finish this briefing. There'll also be, I think there's an analysis piece coming in the next day or so regarding Luis Palma, um, which was supposed to be coming out a couple of days ago, but it was re because he was playing last night. So, We've got that to look forward to as well. Plus, we'll have all the pre-match build up to the Ross County game on Saturday. So keep an eye out on that for Q and A's and all the rest of it. Graham, thank you once again for coming on the show. Thanks, mate. And thank you everyone in the comments for for getting involved. We really do appreciate it. We'll be back around about the same time tomorrow for the latest Celtic briefing. Cheers, guys.